الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. So subhanallah, this surah, as I told you, literally we could have spent an entire session on tabaraka and what that means. Tabaraka rahman So now when you hear, mashaAllah, tabaraka Allah, you know what you're saying, bidnillahi ta'ala. And when you start your salah, by the way, what's the dua that you make? Wa tabaraka smuka. So it combines what we said, tasbih, saying subhanallah, as well as tabarakallah, because the connotations are different for both of those statements, yet both of them are exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they beautifully branch out. Subhanallah, freeing any type of, or freeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any imperfection that's associated to him, glorifying him in his uniqueness and his perfection. Tabarakallah referring to Allah as the source of all blessing, and anything is blessed only by Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa tabarak rahman Now, what makes this surah so beautiful, and the whole Qur'an is coherent. And honestly, I don't think there's anything that quite raises the iman of a person like properly reading the Qur'an, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and appreciating the structure, appreciating the beauty, and appreciating the implications, and the perfection of the words, and the perfection of the placement of the words. So we talked about the beginning, and then the consequences of the choice that you make with the seen and the unseen. So how you interact with the seen and the unseen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you specifically to ponder upon the seen, so that you can come to the conclusion that there is an unseen God that creates this perfection, as you see it, right? Now, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the first half of the surah, look what happens at this turn of the surah. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you about what you see and what you perceive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives you His perspective of His creation. So this is what you're seeing. So you have the imagery of a person that's standing outside and looking around. And you know, subhanAllah, if you watch the Jannah trailer again and again and again, which I hope you will, inshallah, as you share it, but that scene of a person who's looking around and lost, who sees everything as scattered particles around them, wahuwa hasir, strained vision, fatigued, confused, lost. The most miserable people in the world are the people that don't know why they're here. You could give them all the luxury of the world that you want. They could try to fill that void, but the most miserable people in this world are the people that don't know why they're here. Looking around, confused and lost. Wahuwa hasir, strained eyesight. Now subhanAllah, one thing I think about that, I, I remember reading something that was just really profound, and I actually gave a khutbah about this topic. Uh, vacations in classical you know, times, we're actually not a thing. The concept of a vacation is a modern concept to make up for unhealthy work-life balances that we live today. But if you read at any point in history, the idea of a vacation was not a thing because people already factored in certain things, right? How they travel the earth, how they take time out, how they divide their lives. Now you work too hard and you're under this illusion that if you take three days off, you're gonna be happy. But the problem is, is that after you take your vacation, you come back and because of the work that you missed while you're on vacation, you're even more miserable than before you took the vacation, right? So that's one element of it from a time perspective. Not saying that you shouldn't take vacations. I'm just saying it's a modern concept. But the other element that's profound, you know, if you take a moment and you appreciate the sunrise and the sunset, believe it or not, it happens in Detroit too. Sometimes the sun rises and sets here and you can see it sometimes, all right? Most of the time, you don't take the moment to appreciate it unless you're on vacation. So I'm gonna watch the sunrise and watch the sunset and it looks so gorgeous and majestic, but it was the same sun that was outside your door every day of your life. You just never took a moment to look at it and to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? You had a mindset. While you were traveling, you had the mindset of, I'm going to look with the purpose of appreciating beauty and derive tranquility through that. And Allah is saying the believer is always like that. The believer is always paying attention to the elements around them and coming to a place of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything mentioned in the first part of the surah were things that are observable, things that are seen, things that connect you to his majesty and to his sustenance and how that sustenance is part of his mercy. Now the perspective switch. 
Okay? أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Does he who created not know while he is the subtle and the acquainted? Latif, khabir. Ever subtle, ever acquainted. Subhanallah, in, this is the perfect coherence of the Qur'an. And if I rush, it's just because I'm trying to convey as much as I can in a short period of time. But what were the first two names of Allah that we heard in the surah? Al-Aziz Al-Ghafoor. And if you take that section afterwards, everything fits either to the name Al-Aziz or to the name Al-Ghafoor. Al-Aziz, Allah does not test you for purposelessness. And he is also Aziz. He doesn't need you to believe. He doesn't require that. He punishes whom he wills. He rewards whom he wills. His honor is completely independent of anyone else. And whoever believes in him is Aziz only by virtue of believing in Al-Aziz. So his honor is preserved. He punishes whom he wills. He rewards whom he wills. He is too honorable to test without purpose. And he is too great to be moved by those of no purpose. Aziz. Ghafoor. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ Right? He's ghafoor. He's forgiving. Now, you'll notice that the next section of the Qur'an, of, of Surah Al-Mulk, all fit Al-Latif Al-Khabir. These two names will now shape the next section. So Allah gave you two new names of himself. And likely, by the way, when you study the order of revelation, I haven't specifically studied this particular uh, ayah, but you got to understand, they're, they're just being introduced to these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you've heard the name Al-Latif, you've heard the name Al-Khabir, but they're just being introduced. وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ He is Al-Latif Al-Khabir. So he already established that he created and that he created perfectly and that everything functions within a system, the seen and the unseen, and in a way that you can appreciate even with that which he has given you exposure to. And nothing is merely decoration. Even the things that might seem like just decorative elements, they also serve a purpose because Allah does not create without purpose. Then Allah says, don't you think he then knows what he created better than anybody else knows what is created? So he knows your internal parts. He knows your thoughts. He knows the seen and the unseen of even the observable things around you. You know, subhanAllah, as microscopic as science allows us to get with the world around us, there will always be something more to discover. You can never get too microscopic. And however microscopic you get, you will never get to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees. Okay? So he knows you and he knows what he created. وَهُوَ الْلَطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Now, so this, this switch happens. Right? Here's what you should be seeing and hearing. Now here's what Allah sees and hears. Here's what you should be seeing and hearing. And now here's what Allah sees and hears. Um, another thing to point out here, which is, which is really important. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this in Surah Qaf as well. And I, I keep relating Surah Al-Mulk to Surah Qaf because the timing of revelation is similar. And so the tone is very similar as well. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْنَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Before Allah talks about the heedlessness of man, Allah talks about how acquainted, and it's very intimate. I hear what you whisper to yourself. I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَدِيدٌ Everything you say is perfectly preserved. I know you, I see you, I hear you. Then Allah brings it out, right? Surah Al-Mulk kind of happens in the opposite way, but still the same uh, format. So Al-Latif Al-Khabir, the deepest perception that you can possibly have as a human being through the ghafla of this world, through the heedlessness of this world, is the perception of Allah's sight upon you. And that is what drives you constantly. If you're in tune as a believer with Allah's sight upon you, 
you're aware of it, Allah's sight upon you, and that drives you, it will lead you to taqwa and to ihsan. It will lead you to a place of leaving off that which is prohibited and then acting lovingly for that which is extra. Because this is what ihsan becomes. And ta'budu Allah ka'annaka tara. You worship Allah as if you can see Him, and if you know that you can't see Him, then you know that He sees you. And that becomes your driver in life. So you're connected, you're in tune with Allah's sight upon you. When you think something, something to yourself, when you think about doing something, you immediately are governed by Allah hears this right now. When you're about to do something, Allah sees this right now. So whether it is to hold you back from a sin that everybody else is committing, or that no one else sees you doing, or to inspire you to a good deed when no one else is watching, Allah is watching me right now. Allah hears me right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in tune with what I'm even thinking to myself. Allah knows what I'm doing and Allah knows why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that becomes your driver. So you've completely now freed yourself from the zina of this world, from the embellishments of this world. You see through it. You're, not, you're, you're the opposite of one who is heedless. And you're in tune with al-latif al-khabir. I know Allah is ever subtle, yet ever acquainted. And I'm trying to acquaint myself with the sight of the acquainted. I want, I want to act now in accordance with that and be particularly and especially in tune with that. So why would Allah just say, وَهُوَ الْلَطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Because as subtle as Allah is, as acquainted with the details He is. Allah in His mercy does not allow us to see and hear everything of the unseen. So there's a, an element of test here. There's also an element of mercy. I give you an example. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that had he not feared that we wouldn't bury our dead, he would ask Allah to allow us to hear the punishment of the graves. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But could you imagine how difficult it would be for us to function as human beings if when we drove by the graveyards we heard screaming? We wouldn't be able to function. We would be completely paralyzed by that. Right? So it's out of mercy for you that some of the stuff is left in the unseen, if that makes sense. That can also be a mercy for you. But the believer, from a functional perspective, knows that that realm exists, and so they do everything they possibly can to escape Adab al-Qabr, even though they don't hear it and they don't see it. They're very well acquainted with the acquainted, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَسِرُّوا قَوْلَكُمْ أَوَجْهَرُوا بِهِ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ السُّدُورِ There's one more thing to see here, uh, or to say here, that conceal your speech or publicize it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in your chests. Allah knows what's in your hearts. Allah azza wa says, يَعْلَمُ السِرَّ وَأَخْفَى Allah knows the secrets and that which is even less than that. He knows what you say, He knows what you conceal, and He knows what is even less than that. So, وَهُوَ اللَّطِيف الْخَبِيرُ He's ever subtle. Yet he's ever acquainted. And subhanAllah, what was the name of Allah that Yusuf alayhi salam connected with? Al-Latif. That he was subtle. He was subtle throughout my affairs. But the whole time he was ghalibun ala amri. Allah Azza was in charge of my affairs. But subtle. Ever present, yet ever subtle. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هو الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور He is the one who made the earth subservient to you. Meaning, he allowed the surface of this earth to be walkable, to be livable, uh, to be a place of agriculture, to be a surface from which you can construct. He is the one who gave you a surface that is inhabitable, right? And subhanAllah, when you think about what's an inhabitable planet right now, when they're talking about that, right? They're looking at the surface first and foremost. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even starts with that. جَعْلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ذَلُولًا It is submissive to you. فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِبِهَا وَكُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِهِ وَإِلَيْهِ النُّشُورُ So walk on its shoulders, meaning walk its paths that are suitable for travel, and eat from its provision, but know that to him will be the ultimate resurrection. 
The scholars mention that if you look at the earth, subhanAllah, in this regard, how has Allah made it dhalula? How has Allah made it submissive to you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you what you need of this earth to travel upon. So first and foremost, as safar travel. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you its softness so that you could dig within it. So you could plant within it. Imagine if the surface of the earth was all concrete, right? Or metal, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the parts of the earth that are soft. So you can plant within it. You can also uh, stake within it, right? When you need to build something, you need to obviously plant something deep into the ground to give it its foundation so you can use the soft parts of the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the earth fertile so you can grow plants in it and you can sustain uh, from it your lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it manageable and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to be um, you know, stable enough so that it does not crumble away when we stand on it. It's for us to use the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to use it. And this is connected to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So Allah Azza wa Jal tells you how he decorated the lowest heaven for you, but there's a function to that decoration and the function of the stars. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, so if you can't consider the function of that which is above you, look at the function of that which is below you. So the ulama are saying, look at the switch, Allah started off with the surah by saying, look to the heavens and consider the function of the stars. And if you can't benefit from that, now look to the earth beneath you, which you are far more acquainted with, and consider the function of the earth beneath you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by doing so, by bringing this to a greater sense of immediacy, allows you to appreciate the complexity of his creation that you've been taking for granted. Now, what do I mean by that? Taking for granted. If you were to pull someone out from 100 years ago and show them the technology that we have today that we don't even bat an eyelid over anymore, like just whatever, right? They would think this is insane. What is this? But you don't appreciate the complexity of it because you have not been burdened with creating that complexity. All right? You, you're, just consider, you're just concerned with the function. Like, think about satellite TV, right? Sounds crazy to someone that's never seen satellite TV. What in the world? Where did that come from, right? The transmission of signals, and then you think about the internet, and you think about the web, and you think about GPS, and you think about all these things that are happening right now. I mean, we haven't even gotten to uh, AI. Who knows if they'll be running the next retreat? You might not have, like, real people presenting to you. Um, you know, but if they replace anyone, you know, hopefully it'll be Sheikh Abdullah Wahid there to replace him. So. No, he's not here. I can't mess up. I was like, no, no. Where's Sheikh Abdullah? He's not here? Oh, man. You'll have to tell him about it. <laughs> but you don't appreciate the complexity because from a functional perspective, you're not tasked with creating that complexity. So think about the Arabs. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, first and foremost, look at the ground beneath you. Think about how amazing it is how complex yet simple and beautiful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the earth to you. That you know what's stable, what's not stable, that you can build from the soft parts of the earth what is uh, suitable for building buildings, right? Constructing entire lofty buildings, making it hard enough, and then you can plant it back into the earth and make an entire building stable and you can bury your dead in it, and you can grow your food out of it. Like, think about that. That is incredible. SubhanAllah, the surface of the earth is incredible. So, for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِرِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Don't you think if we all like, had an understanding of the complexity of our cars, we would appreciate them more? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look at your camels. Look at your camels. Do they not see the camels that have been created, that they ride upon? Like if you think about the camel, it's a weird animal. It really is. Skinny legs, yet it can hold those massive burdens, the types of travel that it's suitable for. It's an incredible, subhanAllah, an incredible animal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you just took that for granted. You came into this world, and as you grew up, oh, there are camels. You can ride this type of camel and that type of camel, 
and you can benefit it from, from it in this way, but the complexity of it is incredible, right? To where the believer looks at that and says, Subhanallah, Tabarak rahman there is no way that this was humanly invented. How did I take this for granted? And so if you were stripped of the technology and the things that are available to you today that make life so easy for you, and you were able to see them come into being, you would have a much greater appreciation for them. It's like dial-up internet when it first came out. All right? Some of you are like, what is that? So you used to take the CD. Some of you are like, what's that? AOL CD, 1990s, you pop it in, and it made these weird sounds like, you know, I'm not even going to try to make those sounds uh, on here because then someone might take those sounds and put them online. All right? But some, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And like those weird sounds, and then, like, oh my God, you're connected to the internet. And now you're sitting here talking about speeds. Like if you live that time, that's incredible. SubhanAllah. Tabarakallah. But you take the things that are so complex for granted once you are not burdened with the actual inventing and creation of those things. Now, why is this important to the rest of the surah? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, manakabiha wa kulu min rizqihi. Go ahead and walk on the earth and benefit from its provision. But know that one day you will be put into it and you will be resuscitated out of it. To him is the resurrection. Now, subhanAllah, if you think about it now, one day we will all be buried in this earth and then grown out of it like food. If you think about it, subhanAllah, even the process of vegetation, of risk, that you, that you plant seeds, you put something in the ground, and then you see these trees come out, and that's something that's even distant from us, agriculture, right? Like basic things that, that other you know, times in human civilization, they could see this and they could appreciate its beauty right away. Like you plant these seeds and you see these lush trees and lush fruits and vegetation come out, and Allah is giving you a sign that one day you will be put into that earth and something will come from the sky and strike the earth the same way that rain comes from the sky when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it and something will grow out of it and that will be you. You're what's being planted into the earth. So, Go ahead, benefit from it now, eat from its sustenance, but realize one day, it's not you planting and eating the food. One day, you are being planted and resurrected out of this earth. Hence, the profound nature of minha khalaqnakum. We brought you out of it. Wa fiha nu'idukum. And we put you right back into it. And then to him you return. It's incredible. This is not a foreign process to you. You understand the process. You just don't understand that one day you are the product. So you get it. You see it, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after that, by the way, So what gives you such confidence that the earth beneath you will not shake and swallow you when you realize you have absolutely no control over it? So what gives you that sense of security that he who holds that place, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not swallow you into this earth? And then suddenly it would sway. You know, may Allah have mercy on our brothers and sisters that passed away in these earthquakes. I've never been in an earthquake, uh, subhanAllah, but well, actually, we've been in like slight, small, tiny ones, these little tremors in the earth. But, you know, it's really interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about in Surah, you know, إِذَا زُرْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِرْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا Like a human being looks to the ground beneath them as the greatest sense of safety and security. You're on a ship, all right, if the, it gets stormy, the weather, alhamdulillah, we made it, we docked at the land. When you're in a flight and the flight starts to get turbulent and you're afraid it's not going to land, you land, alhamdulillah, we're on the ground. But what happens when the earth beneath you starts to shake? Malaha, what is wrong with it? Because you feel a sense of entitlement to it. Right? 
Like, this is the given. The earth beneath me is not supposed to shake. And so, hence a confusion, because it's a foreign feeling. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I'm into man sama Like, what gives you such confidence that that's not going to happen? That, the, that this place that becomes a place of stability and risk for you will not suddenly become a place of chaos and harm for you. You're not the one who dictates what's happening there. Now again, remember how, however microscopic you get, subhanAllah, like I don't want to get too into the science here, but just think about like the tectonic plates and stuff like that. With all the science we have, you can't predict when an earthquake's gonna happen. You can get as deep into it as you want and see as much, but you don't know because you don't hold that authority. And hence the power of language is so, is so pervasive here. Do you feel secure that the one in the heavens will not shake the earth beneath you? Okay? And Allah mentions the heavens. So here Allah Azza particularly mentions and yaqsifa bikum al-ard. Because people in the past were swallowed by the earth out of punishment. Now earthquakes don't necessarily happen to a people out of punishment. But there are people that are punished through khasf, through the earth swallowing them. And one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is khasf once again, once again happening to people. May Allah protect us, right? So the idea of people being swallowed into the earth as a form of adab from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَمْ أَمِنْتُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءَ أَنْ يُرْسِلَ عَلَيْكُمْ حَاصِبًا فَسَتَعْلَمُونَ كَيْفَ نَذِيرٌ And then you look to the sky, and the sky from which you've come to expect rain and goodness, and you look forward to the rain, why do you have such confidence that it won't rain upon you stone instead of water? Who makes that call from amongst you? And of course, subhanAllah, uh, this is now the opposite side of, you know, zayyanna samaa dunya bi masabih, right? You look to the sky and you can admire its beauty. So what's the difference here? Now obviously, again, there are people, qawm lut, uh, were destroyed by stones from above them. The people of Abraha, who we mentioned, Wadi Muhassar, right? Allah Azza wa Jal rained down upon them. Tayran Ababil, Tarmihim bi hijaratim min sajil, that they were rained down with stones upon them. Now, Subhanallah, what, what ends up happening is that you can become so confident about how that process goes that you could be like the people who said, "Hada aridun mumtiruna, bal huwa mastajaltum bih." Right? So the people of Hud السلام, they saw the clouds coming. They said, oh, this is rain coming. <laughs> no, this is not rain coming. These clouds are not bringing rain. You have a false sense of confidence here that you get to control and dictate what rains from the sky and what comes from beneath the earth. So what is the rapt? What is the, the, uh, the tie that the ulama mentioned here? The sky above you and the ground beneath you are sources of risk, are sources of sustenance so long as you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They become sources of adab once you disobey him. They become sources of punishment once you disobey him. So right now, al-latif al-khabir, tabarak asmu, they are sources of risk for you. When you obey him, when you disobey him, they become sources of adab. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, do you feel a sense of safety, security? Now, the believers don't feel pure amn even though they believe. They don't feel full safety even though they believe. The disbelievers feel safety even though they disbelieve. Right? And this is the meaning of the Hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I don't combine in my servant two feelings of amn, amnain, wala khawfain, two feelings of safety or two feelings of fear. In khafani fi dunya, if they fear me in this life, amantu, then I will give them safety in the hereafter. And if they felt safe for me in this life, then I will cause them to fear me in the next. Now some of you might say that and say, well what about the hadith ana inda dhanna abdi bi, that I am what my servant expects of me. So how do we make this happen? We have hope in Allah, but we don't have hope in Allah that comes out of our own sense of entitlement or arrogance, but our hope is in His mercy. And we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
not because we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a vengeful God, but we fear the result of our own sins. And so both of those feelings drive us to seeking safety and security in him subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are removing the trust that we have in ourselves and placing our trust in his names and his attributes. All right? So the believer always feels like I could be doing better and does not feel, and, and you know, subhanAllah, I, 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 it's, it's hard to even use this word, um, but there was, you know, one of these prominent atheists who said, you know, ref referring to the technological revolution, he said, we have conquered God. There's no need for religion anymore. We've conquered him. And I thought to myself, that guy's ending is going to be so bad if he doesn't repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. you imagine the arrogance? Saying, you know, basically we've live in, we live in a world now. We've produced all the tools. Like I said, as microscopic as you think you've gotten, you actually haven't gotten anywhere at all. Right? But we've produced the tools. So religion was born out of a need for God in the past. Now we don't need it. SubhanAllah. I mean, this is what the, the attitude Allah is referring to here. Amintu man Right? And SubhanAllah, the, the idea here, by the way, and, and this is important for you to think about the world as it's unfolding. As mankind develops more tools, mankind becomes more arrogant, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humbles us over and over and over again. So the most powerful nations in the world can't figure out how to deal with the weather. Think about that. They can't. They can't figure out how to deal with the weather. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us in our place constantly, and the believer, مَهْمَا عَظُمَا uh, salatuhu, as righteous as they may be or as plentiful as their salah may be they never feel a sense of safety all right, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment they find safety in al-mu'min they find safety in him subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they always fear the consequences of the actions of man and of course the greatest example of that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who even when the wind would blow hard, the man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was promised paradise and forgiveness and promised that the punishment would not come while he is amongst the people, taghayyara wajhuhu alayhi salatu wassalam, his face would change and he would flee to his worship immediately, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was always grateful beyond expectation and would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any limitation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says after that, this was my warning. And of course, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to here? This is important, by the way, because you're like, you can almost feel like, why am I being spoken to this way? This is khitab al-kafirin. This is speaking to the arrogant disbelievers, and there is benefit for the believers to understand this as well. This is a, a warning to them. How do you feel safe? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَكَيْفَ كَانَ نَكِيرٌ and there are examples of people that came before you that denied. And how terrible was my punishment for them. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he has left behind athar, left behind um, signs of the punished nations and of punished peoples. And we can see that all around us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves that as an example for us. Sheikh Muhammad al-Shanawi talks about the example of Fir'aun, how Allah azza wa jal promised the preservation of the Pharaoh, that you could look at him as an example for all other pharaohs to come. Now, does that ever stop all people? No, we have pharaohs in every generation, right? People that become Fir'aunic in every generation. But so that those people that have taqwa would see that and they would be reminded and they would hold back from transgression and oppression. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَانْضُرُوا إِلَى مَا Look at their homes, the people of Ad, the people of Thamud. Look at their places so that you can understand people came before you that faced this fate as well. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Notice the name Ar-Rahman comes up multiple times here. Uh, Ar-Rahman, especially in early Meccan Quran, is the most revolutionary name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Ar-Rahman was the first surah recited in public. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recited it in public next to the Kaaba. Ar-Rahman. 
هل تعلم له سميا? Do you know of anyone named Al Rahman other than him before him? This name carries so much from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a name that only belongs to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, Allah is mentioning the various layers of Al Rahman as it affects us. And Allah says, look at the birds above you with their wings outspread sometimes and then folded in. Nothing is holding them up there except the Rahman. It's not their wings. If you think from a pure, again, this is if you woke up to the world and birds didn't exist. And then suddenly, just try to imagine this, you're 25 years old and suddenly we've made these birds that can fly around the world, travel in colonies and formations and patterns, pigeons that can de deliver messages, military messages, between leaders, by the way, that's how communication used to happen, right? I mean, train birds to carry messages around the world before digital technology, you know? Like Salah Adin couldn't text, uh, you know, one of his commanders, right? He sends birds, and you think about what's carrying them up there through violent weather, being able to fly for months on end without taking a break sometimes. SubhanAllah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a lesson for you. By the way, this ayah always gets me in the plane when the turbulence starts. Like I just think about it, I'm like, there is nothing that should be holding this plane up. Right? Especially I feel like those those pilots that come out of Mecca and Medina have a lot of tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they take off the like what are y'all doing, right? But I don't even know if they trained or they just, you know, prayed in the haram for a few years and then suddenly got appointed to be fine. Like, what are you doing? What's holding these planes up? But we've taken it for granted, air travel. You think about, like, talk to someone a thousand years ago and tell them about air travel. What? You're crazy, right? This is something out of a cartoon. It doesn't make sense, right? But now, you don't think when you board a plane, subhanAllah, look at the mechanics, unbelievable. We get to be, you know, tens of thousands of feet in the air and eat the same food and drink that we eat and connect as well, text people on the earth. Like, it does, like that's a lot to take in. Now look at the simplicity of the beauty of a bird. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing you. And Allah is saying, you think it's their wings that are carrying them up there? You really think that they develop wings? Now here's the thing. What makes you any different from that bird? Right? What makes you any different from that bird? Right? You think it's your brain? You think it's your functionality? You really think you got this? مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَى الرَّحْمَانِ Nothing carries them except the Rahman. And nothing sustains you except the Rahman. Don't think it's anything you developed on your own. You came from nothingness just like they did. Aladi khalaq al mauta wal haya. Subhanallah, also the complexities. The scholars say once again the complexities of the bird. Uh, I'm fascinated by birds. I really am. I love, subhanallah, I love all the different types of birds. And I remember, um, you know, we went to the zoo, and I tell this story multiple times because it made me think about Jannah. Uh, when the, the zookeeper was showing us a particular type of eagle and saying, these eagles, if you were to hang a newspaper six football fields away, they could read the fine print. I thought, subhanAllah, that's amazing, right? I said, wow, what's our vision like in Jannah? Like if Allah Azawajal is giving you an example like that, incredible. The hummingbirds, you know that a hummingbird weighs what a penny weighs? These are incredible creatures. And Allah is saying, look at them. Look up. Again, the ulama say, Allah is citing as sama ad dunya He's not tasking you to look beyond that. Right? Allah is not talking about the angels. Now, what's more amazing than those birds up there? The Prophet is saying that there is not a hand span in the entirety of the heavens. Think about this. Not a hand span in the entirety of the heavens, except that there is an angel that is standing or bowing or prostrating and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not this much. You know how big the universe is? What's observable even? If you could shine a lens on that and you could see the angels, if Allah revealed, remember, Allah took away one lens and said, I'm going to let you see the angels. And you saw all the angels in the heavens. You would be overwhelmed by it. Allah is saying, look at the birds. So you see the birds, uh, you know, uh, ahead of you, and nothing holds them except Ar-Rahman. Innahu bi kulli shayin basir. Allah subhanahu wa taala sees all things, 
And Allah says, أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ جُنْدٌ نَكُمْ يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ الرَّحْمَانِ هِنِ الْكَافِرُونَ إِلَّا فِي غُرُورِ Do you really think that there could be an army to then aid you against one who creates like this? Verily, the disbelievers are in nothing but uh, delusion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he gives us this imagery, of course, there's an immediate function of this, which is these are the people that are living within one generation of the destroyed army of Abraha. So some people, their fathers saw what happened to the army of Abraha that tried to destroy the Kaaba. Right? There might have even been people living, because Amul Fil, right, is not that much before that. There may have been people even living that witnessed the year of Al Fil as the Quran is coming down to allude to it. So those birds that you look to for beauty, what if they start raining down pelting stones upon you? Can you imagine that? Are you going to facilitate, are you going to prepare an army that can fight? Right? Fight back if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waged war upon you? What are you going to do with the one who creates and created your ability to think and always knows and facilitates and allows what you're able to make? And by the way, every tyrant in history at some point writes the story for their own destruction. And you can always see the path of that arrogance. They think that they're independent. They think that they've got something that no other people have. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humbles them and teaches them a lesson. I always think about the Israeli army. I know I'm saying it on camera and I don't care. You know, they use, subhanAllah, they use military equipment and they think they're so smart. And they think they've achieved the peak of intelligence of, of creation and they're experimenting with these weapons. On these people, may Allah grant them shahada and Gaza. Wallahi, with full certainty, one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humble them. Without any doubt. Right? So they think. They think that. And the next time you see it, because we know how they act in Ramadan, the next time you see it, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ghalibun ala amri, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will handle that as he has handled those like them before that thought they reached the place where we are immune. And Allah says, Amman hadha ladhi, huwa jundun nahum. Do you think you have an army, yansurukum min dunur rahman? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see that victory uh, for our brothers and sisters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says afterwards, Amman hadha ladhi, yarzukukum in amsaka rizqa, bal ladju fi utu win wa nufur. Who is it that would provide for you if Allah withheld provision? If Allah caused the drought, what are you going to plant? What are you going to bring out of this earth? And subhanAllah, before Dajjal comes, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the world would experience drought with all of the technology that we have. The world would experience severe drought for years. Severe drought, right? So that earth becomes barren and all the technology you're able to produce and all the plant-based foods, what happens when you can't make the plants to make the plant-based foods and it's all gone, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, who's going to provide for you if he holds back his risk? But rather they persist with this, this pride and they flee from the truth. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions after that, So, is the one who walks fallen on his face better guided or the one who walks standing straight on the straight path? Now, what is this referring to? There's a profound message here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with certain norms that we could take for granted. And when Allah azawajal gives you an image that is foreign to you, you think to yourself, how is that possible? Not thinking the reality that is familiar to you is also not supposed to be possible. So when the Prophet ﷺ said that on the Day of Judgment, people will be walking on their faces. May Allah protect us. That there will be people walking on their faces. The natural question from the Sahaba was, Ya Rasulullah, how do they walk on their face? Because you think to yourself, how can someone walk on their face? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said what? The one who caused them to walk on their legs will cause them to walk on their faces. Who made it so that you walk on legs? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will switch it so that they now walk on their faces. So you don't take that uh, for granted. And that's one tafsir of the ayah, by the way. So some of them refer to uh, the forms of ibadah 
and, uh, and things of that sort in this life. Others said that this is actually referring to the Day of Judgment as it fits into um, the, the theme uh, as it goes uh, forward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ وَالْأَبْصَارَ This is the summary of the surah. Okay? Say, he is the one who produced you and made for you hearing and vision and your ability to perceive. How little do you show gratitude? Wasa'al al ma'arif, as we said, the faculties by which you came to know or you should be coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has given you now at this point of the surah, as we come to the last 10 of the surah, Allah has given you the explanation of what exists around you, of your existence, of the seen and the unseen, and why you have been given the blessings to be able to perceive the truth when it is presented to you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, huwa ladhi ansha'akum, he produced you, just like those plants you produce, he produced you. And he gave you your hearing, he gave you your vision, he gave you your, your perception. See, subhanAllah, the, the tone shifts here. Some of the ulama mention that when you are admonishing someone, you may use in the beginning of your admonishment, you know, first and foremost, a tone of punishment. But then, and all of the moms and dads are like, yeah, I use that. <laughs> I switch. You then switch to, like, come on, all that I've done for you, everything I've done for you, the tone of gratitude. And that is a tone that has not yet shown in this particular part of, in this surah, until now, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, how ungrateful are you? Like, I gave you all of this, not just so you can believe, but how ungrateful are you to turn away from the one who gave you all of this and then gave you the ability to understand it and appreciate it and benefit from it. جَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَ how little do you show of gratitude? Say, it is he who spreads you throughout this earth, and to him you will be gathered in like manner. SubhanAllah, think about all of the graves in the world today, and just the sight of everyone rising and being spread throughout this earth once again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he made the earth suitable for all of these different functions in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the earth of Qiyamah suitable for only one purpose, resurrection. The entire Ard al-Mahshar, the entire land of assembly, is one surface. It's all the same color, it's all the same type, and it is only for the purpose of holding you so that you could now be held accountable. That's it. So there's no, no longer any uh, variation in the different types of earth that have been produced. I'm sorry. They say, well, when is this going to happen if you're telling the truth? So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to an apprehension inside of them. Many people who reject religion today reject it because they find it to be inconvenient to what they think they can accomplish right now. So they want to live a certain type of lifestyle. They want to enjoy certain types of life. And they have in their minds that one day, when the time comes, I can make the switch as is necessary. So I'll catch that window. It's the delusion of youth, young people that think, I'll get religious later, I'll figure this all out later. And many of those who lived around the Prophet ﷺ were waiting it out, okay? They had a feeling that what he was saying was true, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they also did not want to bear the inconveniences of believing in him and so they thought to themselves, we'll wait till this all kind of pans out. And then at that point, should the opportunity present itself and it be convenient, then we'll join Team Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's how they were weighing this, right? So they start to ask from a place of apprehension, either from a place of apprehension or from a place of intimidation. Go ahead and make it happen. That's one group of people, right? Go ahead and make it happen, right? Which is what the people of Nuh alayhi salam did. You know, we're sick of you warning us. Go ahead, make it happen. Challenging and intimidating. Another group that actually wanted to know if they could have time to make the switch in time. So like if the Prophet ﷺ says, I'm telling you 20 years from now, all right, that I'm waiting 19 years. Okay, I seem pretty healthy. I think I can escape death for the next 19 years. That's a chance I'm going to make. So I'm waiting 20 years. 
or 19 years to make that switch. So there were two groups that the ulama mentioned here, two camps that were asking the Prophet ﷺ, Say that that knowledge is with Allah. Stop being silly. He is the one who knows everything. He is the one who is subtle and acquainted. I'm just the warner here, a plain warner. Now the one thing that Allah has not mentioned of the punishment to come was the seeing of it. SubhanAllah, he mentioned uh, uh, them hearing the punishment, them feeling the punishment, and now al-basara, seeing the punishment. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُ زُلْفَةً سِيئَتْ وُجُوهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَقِيلَ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَدْدِعُونَ So when they see it approaching, you will see their faces distressed. So Allah is giving you, you know, He's giving you two visions here, His perspective and then the perspective of everyone else. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what they're seeing and how they're being seen. So if you could see the faces of those same people, and if they could see what they've been warned of all this time, and they are told, this is that which you have been promised. Finally, and I'm over time, I apologize. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنِيَ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ مَعِيَ أَوْ رَحِيمَنَا فَمِنْ يُجِيرُ الْكَافِرِينَ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Say, have you considered if Allah was to cause my death and those with me or have mercy upon us, who would protect you from a painful punishment? Meaning what? The greatest rahmah that Allah has sent to you is rahmatan lil alameen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This message, this message, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an ali tashqa, was not sent to punish or deprive or cause you anxiety. It was sent to redirect you and grant you salvation. That just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you about in this earth, and gave you these blessings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring you about once again and give you blessings that you would have never imagined. Fihi ma la ra'at, that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no perception or imagination has ever grasped. So Allah is giving this to you for a reason. So if you hate me so much, and you hate the Muslims so much, and you want to get rid of us, have you considered who's going to save you? Like, we'll go on our way, but who's going to save you? قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانِ آمَنَّا بِهِ وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَلْنَا Say, He is the most merciful. We have believed in Him, and upon Him we have placed our trust. فَسَتَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ هُوَ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Then you will come to know who is in clear error at some point. Um, the scholars say about this, the profound message, Allah Azzawajal gives of this dunya to those whom He loves and those who He does not love. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala only gives Jannah to those that He loves. Okay, and Allah يعطي الدنيا لمن يحب ومن لا يحب. Allah gives this dunya to those that He loves and those who He does not love. But He only gives Jannah to those that He loves. And when hardship comes in this world, Allah gives hardship in this world to those that He loves and those that He does not love. However, the people who say هو الرحمن آبنا به وعليه توكلنا, those people are not tested in this world out of punishment. They're tested in this world out of elevation. So even the tests that come to them are rahma because they're means of elevation for them as well. So distinguish yourself by saying, "Who are Rahman? Amanna bihi wa alihi tawakkalna, fasa ta'alamuna man huwa fi dalal mubin. Qul araaytu min asbaha ma ukum ghawra, fama yatiikum bima imma'in." Say, have you considered if your water was to be become sunken into the earth, then who could bring you flowing water? Subhanallah, uh, this is. The surah started off with the, the great affair of life and death, and it ended with the simple need for water. Throughout mankind, throughout history, the one necessity of life is water, and if Allah took away that water, then mankind falls apart. No human civilization can survive without water, no matter how powerful, no matter how advanced it is, right? And what is the powerful function here? قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنِيَ الرَّحْمَانِ Say, if Allah was to take us away, Water is also guidance, or guidance is also likened to water. So if the guidance was taken away from you, where are you going to find it? If guidance is taken away from you, where will you find spiritual life? And where will you find that sense of purpose? Physically, if it was taken away from you, where are you going to find water? What technology, what tools have you developed that will get you out of a drought? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to take away that water, Ar-Rahman, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from, Ibadur Rahman, from the servants of the Most Merciful, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from his punishment and make us amongst those that are rewarded generously on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma ameen.